Thank you for joining us with another episode of the Memories of Plymouth program. I'm Louise McCormick from the Plymouth Historical Society and for the past five years we have been reaching out to our community members to interview them so they could share their stories, uh, memories about what it's been like for them to live here, work here, socialize here. We're going a little bit off the track today, if I can. That's an interesting pun for the railroad <laughs> from way back when. <laughs> I caught that. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> and we would, instead of interviewing their live stories, we would like to specifically talk about a business that was here, an occupation, a profession that was here for years, Tenny Mountain. You and I have skied it. We have such warm memories as a result of it. And we have two of the four family members that worked it. Is that fair? They worked it uh, during their youth, headed by mom and dad. Mm -hmm. and, all right. And I'm going to stop my part and pass it over to Gardner and Stephen Hall. Gentlemen, thank you for doing this. I, I think it's about time that we make sure that we have captured the history of Tenney Mountain. So it's really important. We Yes, we can get stuff on paper, but we want those memories of how this came to be. So I'm looking forward to listening from both of you. Oh, thank you. All right. Uh, I, asked, I should ask the question first. When did it actually begin? When did you open the doors of Tenney Mountain? Well, because I stood under the sign <laughs> and got photographed with Janie French and, and Penny Hall, uh, it was December. Uh, 1960. 60. All right. And we want to give credence to mom and, uh, mom and dad and the Frenches as well. Can you talk briefly about mom and dad? Yes. Uh, father and mother were uh, uh, skiers. Uh, my father more avid than my mother, but uh, uh, she, was a, uh, she was a good sport and, uh, and, and uh, went uh, in, uh, in the early days uh, uh, with him all over the place. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure about uh, the, the situation with uh, John and Hope. Um, well, John was an accomplished skier. Uh, oh, he, uh, you know, he was a, a decent skier, and of course, uh, his kids went on to become uh, good skiers. Yes, um, <clears throat> and and of course, they did a lot of uh, their cruising for Draper Corporation on skis. Uh, snowshoes as well, but uh, I have a lot of pictures of them on skis uh, working for Draper Corporation. And I guess uh, might as well talk about on the back side of Tenney was uh, a piece of property that was uh, the uh, stumpage was owned by Draper Corporation at the time, so my fa our father and John were cruising that and uh, <coughs> they kept looking into uh, Tenney that is, has a northeast exposure and that means it's out of the wind and it's out of the sun essentially which protects your snow especially with snow snow making that's very important okay. and my father referred to it uh, to us as he noticed it was a snowball and so that caught his attention and uh, that kind of was the beginning of his interest in that particular area. But this wouldn't have been their first venture, correct? No. no. That's uh, Stephen uh, knows about the, that. the the initial uh, adventure started on family land in Alexandria when they established uh, when my my father graduated from Brown University. Uh, he uh, uh, they established the Cardigan Ski Club in 1938. And uh, with a 20 by 20 uh, a cabin uh, just down the road from the Appalachian Mountain Club Lodge. Uh, and uh, after the war, uh, we moved to Alexandria, uh, not on family land, by the way. Uh, and um, my, right away, my parents purchased 750 acres adjacent to the Appalachian Mountain Club. Uh, uh, in an area called Clark's Pastures, which was still open pastures at the time. It had a westerly exposure. Uh, it was an, a place where the Appalachian Mountain Club people used to uh, gravitate to. 
uh, to uh, ski. Uh, and eventually, um, my father built, uh, you know, installed a 600-foot rope tow uh, on that property. Uh, but even then, he was thinking ahead, and I know he had talked to me about, uh, you know, not so much stuff. I overheard him talking about a double chair lift along the northern uh, property line uh, of the uh, pastures. So uh, the, the operationally, the rope tow worked great. Uh, fiscally, uh, it was a disaster because uh, very few people came uh, to ski there because of its inaccessibility. Uh, I don't know that we ever lacked any snow, to tell you the truth, in spite of the exposure. And that's on Cardigan. Yes, Cardigan Mountain <coughs> in Alexandria. And, uh, so it was uh, left idle for a while, but reinstituted and moved to the Duke's Slope at uh, the AMC Lodge, and uh, we ran it for a year. Uh, and then sold it to the AMC, uh, and uh, in that year, we, uh, uh, my father made back all of his uh, investment in it. The, the real expense was uh, the rope. Uh, the, the motive power plant was a, a $50 uh, used car, uh, 19, uh, 34 uh, Dodge, hmm. and uh, then there were then there were some fabrications using wheels uh, to uh, run the rope, but the rope cost at that time a dollar a foot, which was an expensive situation. Wow. I mean that's twelve hundred dollars right there in nineteen late nineteen forties <laughs> money. <coughs> so the, the focus once we moved to Plymouth became uh, the land in the snow bowl at Tenney Mountain and uh, my father and John very quietly uh, purchased in a checkerboard fashion uh, pieces of land uh, with and without stumpage. Uh, and uh, so as to get the land. And I think that ended up being 1,200 acres. 1,200 and then another 100 acres, which is now Plymouth Conservation Land <coughs> for a total of 1,300 at one point. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, basically what my father described as, as a quarter of a township. Yeah. Roughly 6,000 mm -hmm. acres being a township. Wow. So the, the first time that I uh, learned anything about in, of an interest in Tenney Mountain was we were driving south on Route 3A and my father said, looks over and says, what do you think of that terrain up there? And I thought, uh, that's kind of an off the wall question. I, I didn't know what to think at the time. But by uh, the, uh, probably around in late March, early April of 1957, uh, my father invited me to, uh, uh, in the early morning, to walk up uh, with shouldering our skis uh, on the crust up to the top of Tenney Mountain and ski down through the woods. And partway down, uh, we stopped, and he questioned me about what I thought. And my answer was, and I remember this really clearly, it's like Sunapee, only better. And uh, by the by the summer, they had uh, he, uh, he and John had uh, mapped out uh, the area uh, that they 
uh, how they wanted to design the parking lot and the road and the ski area and, and not. But they still hadn't bought the very last was piece of the Was that the bank lot that was the last one? I think it I think might it have been. it was the Bristol Bank because I remember him trying to make sure that uh, uh, <clears throat> the president of the bank didn't realize what he was doing um, <clears throat> so that they could put this together and buy it. And by the way, uh, that the price on all that acreage uh, was uh, $6,000. And a lot of it at a dollar an acre, yeah, uh, and, and some of it at a lot more. <clears throat> so that Incredible. was the going price for land in those days. Yeah. What background did Mr. French, mm -hmm. your dad, have relative to knowing? Was one a survey s surveyor? Oh, uh, uh, both. Yes, both were surveyors. Oh. Both were foresters. Thank you. Both Thank worked you. for Draper Corporation. My father uh, <coughs> was the first forester uh, there after the war. Uh, and uh, Wayne Lewison had originally been the forester, and so he went to become the mill manager, and he hired my father as his replacement. And then, because of the amount of uh, territory that Draper had to manage, which included uh, lands in not only New Hampshire but in Vermont. New York State New York, and, yeah. and in Maine, mm -hmm. uh, he needed a deputy and uh, very swiftly uh, hired John French. Okay. So they, they worked together for a long time before anything to do with Tenney Mountain. When they worked for Tenney Mountain, when they owned Tenney Mountain, did Mr. French have a certain responsibility in your dad? And the wives have a certain responsibility? Well, the corporate structure was uh, my father was, uh, our father was president. Uh, uh, John was vice president. Uh, well, he was treasurer too, I thought. B Bernice was treasurer, oh. and I think Hope was secretary. I believe that uh -huh. was the structure. Yeah. Okay. okay. <clears throat> so all four were, you know, yes. the, the corporation, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And now, if, you, if we move over to <coughs> Uh, opening day, uh, and uh, remember that we, on December of 1957, uh, the final uh, piece of land necessary to put the puzzle together uh, was purchased. And so Christmas Day happened to be a miserable, rainy uh, day, but it was just perfect for Sam Hall to grab his kids and, and go out to Chet Kinsley's place and start cutting the road in from Kinsley's uh, uh, house on up uh, on, on the uh, surveyed uh, route that he and John had already laid out. Was that when Roy Valia showed up? He yes. Said, I know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, Roy Valia uh, came up from his little store uh, to uh, look at what's going on uh, because we didn't stop uh, at, at afternoon of Christmas Day. It was, it was vacation so we were working right up to New Year's hmm. and uh, uh, and Father said, uh, oh, we're building a road. He said, I know you, Sam Hall. This is a ski trail. <laughs> well, it was a road. To a ski Roy trail. Had, <laughs> Roy, Roy had figured it out. <laughs> the little store you're talking about? Yes. That's not the one that's still there. Popsicle yes. Joe's. Yes. Yes. Wow. Yep. I we should find out. Popsicle I Joe. should find out the, <clears throat> the history of that oh, store yeah. at some point in time. Yeah. Anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so... We tried to open earlier on, uh, and the, very quickly the, the road was cleared up in the parking lot, it was uh, uh, bulldozed, uh, the road, and, and the trails were cleared, uh, and the lift line halfway up. Mm. And I remember also uh, going up, I'm trying to think when this was, uh, probably it was uh, spring of 58, uh, March, April, 
uh, we uh, got up early in the morning and scun up the mountain between uh, with uh, uh, with uh, uh, my father Keith and uh, John French, and we laid out the six uh, thousand foot uh, lift line, <coughs> and uh, we're back for breakfast. <laughs> early bird. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a lot of that going on in those days. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Up and at it. You know, we were in no time to hang out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, uh, at any rate, uh, the initial effort that was put in was what we called Little Tenny. It was a thousand uh, foot T bar on a practice slope. Uh, that had about a 22 degree uh, was a slope. tough beginner slope. Mm. Uh, it was pretty steep for beginners. Uh, yeah, six acre uh, trail yeah. Uh, uh, slope. Yeah, and and a small trail. And a small right? trail. Yeah, mm. and uh, the 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 T bar lift that mm. we purchased was uh, a what is called a Tibru for Theodore Brunner. It was a Swiss built. Uh, and designed lift, and uh, it came over all packaged. I remember when we got it, but no <laughs> instructions that I recalled. Uh, when when that was purchased, uh, well, when it arrived yeah. on, on the docks in Boston, yeah. uh, uh, Dad got me up in the wee hours. I mean, it was just pitch black out, <laughs> and I was in my PJs, and he took me and he put me in the passenger seat of uh, Stub Monroe's logging truck. Oh, yeah. And I rode to Boston with this man that I don't even know if I'd met him before, and John and Dad went down in the uh, BB River uh, black Chevrolet, uh -huh. and we went down, and I slept all the way down, and then I can remember waking up and being on the docks uh, and kind of looking around, and there were all these boxes with... Uh, I think they said Tenny Mountain on them, uh, even then, uh, and they were loaded, of course, on uh, uh, Stub Monroe's uh, uh, logging truck, and then we went back. So that was my first rem memory of the Tebru 1,000-foot uh, yep. lift, which I then was one of the first to ride on, along with Dickie Searles and Janie French and my sister. They used us as uh, guinea pigs and weight as as they Jack, adjusted, Jackie oh, I'm sure Jack was there. there all the kids were there, <laughs> and uh, it took about an hour to go up the lift the first time because they were tinkering with the clutch and the VW engine, which it was powered by. And I think that uh, uh, Randy Currier's dad was over there helping with them because it was a, a VW engine, oh. uh, and um, I know that. Uh, uh, Eddie Ladd was, uh, yeah. I think, around during all of that, and of course the engine was up in the roof that's, system. That's right. And they were up. It's a Volkswagen mm -hmm. industrial engine, so Kip and Joe serviced it. Mm -hmm. right. It mm -hmm. was like a 40 horse engine running that lift, yeah. with stanchion yeah. towers and spring loaded yeah. yeah. gearboxes. Yeah. Yeah. And this morning, when I grabbed that gavel, I stepped on a Tebru T bar in order to reach for it, which uh -huh. I still have. Hmm. How did you know that you needed this um, Tebru company to work with, deal with? I don't know how he came up with that. I, I have no idea, but, okay. but it's interesting. We did, we went on a ski trip up into Canada. And had a they yeah. had, I think, a Tibru lift. Yeah, that and, would make sense. And I think that was what mm -hmm. sealed things. Uh, <clears throat> we would we would go around to different ski areas to mm -hmm. understand how things were and and to to listen to people as uh, opinion mm -hmm. of stuff. It was a comfortable T-bar to ride. Oh, yes. uh, I remember the Waterville T-bars with the yep. telescopic yep. poles and a lot of other areas. They were especially difficult uh, yep. uh, because they would hang to a certain distance automatically, yep. whereas the, it was the Tebru would adjust to whatever. Correct. Mm -hmm. Why well, the name? Uh, Why? Again, Th that was the Theodore, Theodore Bruner. Bruner. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, and he sold out. 
to to Walter Stadley. Walter Stadley. Uh, Stadley was uh, mm -hmm. part of uh, uh, Brunner's uh, entourage. Mm -hmm. I'm not certain, but I think it was stately absorbed by Doppelmayr. And yes, on. that yeah. is correct. So, hmm. so it's the early yeah. beginnings of you know Doppelmayr and all of that. What, what they were there were two. <coughs> Brunner had uh, two outshoots. One was Mueller, mm -hmm. and one was uh, Stately. And uh, they for for all thing, if you looked at the Swi the the lifts in Switzerland. They look exactly the same. Hmm. However, the export stuff that came over had a different uh, uh, top uh, uh, tower and pulley design. Hmm. Uh, they and, and the reason yeah. was they they used those uh, channels, those bent channels, to uh, and uh, and close the um, the uh, uh, pulley wheels, you know, all right, uh, yeah. in and yeah. protect them, and then would board it over. Uh, whereas the stuff that was in Switzerland would all be uh, a, a typical truss work. Hmm. Uh, the name of the mountain, Tenny Mountain. Yes. Does that come from someone? Um, the Tennies. Yeah. Who I, I met one of them, and it would have been in the uh, 70s somewhere. Uh, because I was in my late teens, I think, and uh, a gentleman walked into the parking lot, drove into the parking lot, and then walked up to us. We were doing summer maintenance, <clears throat> and I think I was with Al Jaynes uh, at the time, and mm -hmm. uh, he identified himself as a tenny and was interested in, uh, he heard there were uh, old foundations, uh, stone foundations at the bottom of the mountain, and of course I knew where those were. And I took him down and he looked at it and he had a memory of going in one of those houses, staying with uh, a grandfather or some grandparents, <coughs> and uh, he kind of had a, you know, a moment where he went back to his childhood and remembered all of that. Mm. That's great. That's special. That's really special to hear the history of it. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. What are some of the highlights over the years that you can remember? <clears throat> well, we want to finish the opening. Okay. Take me uh, back. Okay. <laughs> so, when I came home for Thanksgiving vacation uh, in 1960, uh, we uh, we were erecting the towers for the T-bar. And uh, I used my tractor, uh, the J5 Bombardier, to put them up. Uh, and one of the things that stuck in my mind, and, and meanwhile, they, they, uh, people were working hard uh, on the uh, top and bottom uh, stations. Uh, Doc Crane was involved. Uh, he was very interested in this. But uh, one of the things that stuck in my mind was trying to uh, identify what uh, uh, what was what out of top and bottom. And stuff came in uh, duly uh, labeled T uh, and B. And it took us a while to understand that that wasn't top and bottom. That was Talstation on Bergstation, Berg being mountain and Tal being valley. <laughs> Just the opposite. <laughs> <coughs> so you rode the T-bar down for the first time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <coughs> wow. Wow. On opening day, uh, just leading up to opening day, around the 20th of December, <coughs> we were dispatched with Madison Sears truck over to the, uh, the Alexandria farm and we brushed off uh, a, uh, a bunch of uh, stored uh, uh, pieces prefab. of a prefab <coughs> camp mm -hmm. and put it aboard uh, Madison Sears tr truck and by uh, nightfall all four walls of Little Tenny, the, the, the base lodge, the little lodge. Uh, was, were put up. And, it, I, and, and they, 
it, they went onto a, a, a preformed uh, concrete pad, and then the uh, it, all it took was being roofed in and, and glazed. And, and that's still there today, and that was Mike Long's and my Little Lodge Tavern, yeah, oh which we then added on to uh, to accommodate uh, liquor uh, regulations uh, where the bathroom has to be in the building, which it was not at the time. It was a separate yeah. bathhouse. Right. Mm -hmm. there, there was a, uh, it, there was a uh, standalone <coughs> bathroom <coughs> heated by propane. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember very clearly I, uh, I had the uh, a mission of, uh, of digging uh, with, a, with a pick in frozen ground at about uh, zero degrees oh. uh, f for the oh, uh, septic tank. Mm. And uh, essentially what happened uh, is that there was no electricity at Little mm -hmm. Tenny uh, as built. Uh, it was lit by a, a twin a propane mantle lamp uh, over the uh, Snack the bar, yeah, yeah, <clears throat> and uh, my mother ran the snack bar. Initially, it was it was a plank <laughs> with two this, fifty-five this gallon it, drums. It was, and and Hope French right next to her uh, at the ticket window. Mm. And, mm. And I have a was, picture on that disc yeah. of, and it's like hamburger twenty-five cents or yeah. whatever, and Luca and, and all of that. <laughs> So they were the crew. Yep, mm -hmm. yep. And mm -hmm. the kids, uh, Penny and I, and uh, Jan, and uh, I'm not sure John got into that. He's a little older, Johnny. Uh, but he had to sweep the floor and, you know, load soda in. Uh, Family affair. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. No choice. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> exactly <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. I ended up being uh, dispatched up to the, uh, uh, to the top station to uh, assist uh, people taking tea, uh, the mm -hmm. teas off. Because we we found that we we really needed an attendant up there, uh, and my father would be loading them uh, on at the bottom. That was a dangerous job. Uh, yeah, uh, could catching be. tees. Could be Bob yeah. Fry, John French. Uh, yeah. A lot of people did that. Yeah, uh, you obviously. And if people let them go instead of hand them to you, you've got a tee coming at you on a recoil uh, yeah. at a pretty good clip, <laughs> and if the point it can get you mm. anywhere. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Kind of. Hmm. The trick was to grab the rope, yeah, and control the recoil yeah. back into the spring box. Yeah, yeah. So, it, it, and and uh, for a groomer, <coughs> we we had the uh, uh, the J five bombardier. Started with a bombardier and yeah. a ridiculous roller. Yeah. That looked more like some kind of windmill with yeah. fins on it. And uh, oh, that was a. That was a, a cast-off blower. Uh, That's mode, what it looked like. Uh, thing from oh. BB River. That makes sense to me now. It was it was a scrap item. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Make do with what you have. And, well, and then mm -hmm. initially packing was all uh, so much by foot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I still remember seeing uh, Billy Crampton, later Bill Crampton, when he wasn't Billy anymore, uh, out packing his. Mother of father, he dropped him off for the day, mm -hmm. and he was out there in a sweater packing away. And I'm just wondering who this energetic kid was. <laughs> and he's a little older than I am, and uh, of course he was part of the crew that later, when the uh, again we walked to the top on the yep. frozen snow, it was Dad, Billy Crampton, Sharon, Sonia. Yeah, uh, I was there, and I think one of the Tapleys might have been. Dicky Tapley. Dicky Tapley. <coughs> and uh, we Who all hiked went up. On, he went on to when the, uh, uh, head up uh, 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 Belknap. Oh, wow. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Gunstock. Yeah, Gunstock. And, and, he's, and he's out west. Uh, yeah. Last I knew he was out west at a big hmm. mountain. Yeah. So all of us went up with uh, Dad, and, and then we skied down, and the lift line was completely cut, and I'm not sure if the other trails, which were initially the Goodwin and the Patterson. Correct. After oh. the loggers. Yeah. And, the uh, two families. They mm. named it after the two families that cut the trails. Thank and you. We, uh, we skied that. That's the first time mm. I skied the mountain, and that yeah. would have been um, in the early 60s. Yeah, it was when I was set, uh, in the Army. Right, right. Think about the weather you had over time. And of course, we can go back as kids saying the weather today is not like the weather then. <laughs> Uh, we remember being there skiing, and whoever put the blankets <laughs> over us, mm -hmm. over us, it yeah. was that cold. Not yes. on us, but yeah. over yes. us. 
I, I'm thinking, did you ever record? <coughs> what was the highest, what was the lowest temperature? Well, I, I know when I skied, uh, the lowest temperature with Wes Howard, I don't know what we were thinking, but we were about 12 years old. <laughs> and we went out and the, the, uh, <coughs> the mercury read 40 below zero at the top. That wasn't the wind chill. That was 40 oh, below yes. wow. straight okay. temperature, mm -hmm. um, which I've experienced a number of times. It is New England after all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we decided we had to go for <coughs> a run, which was really foolish. And, uh, and the wind was blowing a little mm. bit, and of course you're skiing. So I estimated one time it was like 100 below equivalency, whatever. And partway down by Tower 12, Wes was having a meltdown you know, he's an 11 year old kid, his mitts are frozen solid, yeah. they're soaking wet, they're frozen solid, it can clack them together like, mm. uh, you know, they're just bricks. And I had to tell him, you're, you're going to die out here, mm -hmm. you're going to keep going. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we went down, that was the only, both of us got frostbite. Mm -hmm. We were covered, mm -hmm. like you said, we, we had scarves mm -hmm. and everything on and the blankets and all of that. But that was the coldest that I remember. That's wow. a... Oh, uh, wow. a, a, a Above uh, above Tower Twelve or Thirteen uh, was uh, wow. Well, there's a wind. There was a, it, it. It opened itself up to the wind up right there. out of Canada, which is why there are windmills That's there. And right. quite frankly, yeah. uh, I'm the one that called Kinetic Energy back in the late '70s and said, "There's potential for wind towers yeah. there." So hmm. anybody who hates the wind towers, yeah. don't call. Yeah, <laughs> the. Uh, uh, and, and that was a six, that's a six thousand foot uh, chairlift, which is it's uh, eight hundred feet longer than the aerial tramway. It's four hundred feet longer than uh, Waterville's main lift, uh, and it it really is on a cold day. <coughs> it's just too far. It's it was a twelve well, minute ride. Right. People would say. Yeah. Oh, it's such a slow lift. Well, the rope speed was 500 feet, and, and Waterville's was 500 feet. Every fixed grip was 500 feet at the time. The difference being, it was 1,000 feet longer than everything else. Yeah. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's why mm -hmm. it seems slower. You're going a lot farther. That's right. And people you know, didn't grasp that, but they did around Tower 13. They started to get a clue. And, and, was, uh, and, the, and the people that we, we had an attendant at the top and, and ski uh, school, uh, Patrol. Uh, ski patrol, mm -hmm. and if they thought that there, somebody was getting frostbite, they'd grab them into that small shelter at the top. We put you'd put signs up for you know frostbite, yeah, mm -hmm. danger yeah. and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Yeah. I don't remember your family ever making snow. No, no, we never did. This guy and we made did. a little snow on Russell Street. Tried to with Keith. You made sleet, kind of. Yeah, you, you got something with the mist blower. Yes, that they blew chemicals on uh, the power lines, defoliants, and had the. Uh, I'm sure it was your idea to yep. pump water through there. Yep. And the, the the nozzles weren't quite correct, but I still remember you blowing that thing yep. in the driveway yep. right by the carriage barn at yep. Russell Street. That's right. And you were making kind of a sleet. Yep. But not on the mountain. No, oh, no, not on the mountain. No. Okay. But, and uh, I uh, I looked at the mm -hmm. uh, the uh, economics of the whole thing, uh, and it. If you make snow, it doubles your capital investment, and it at least triples, if not quadruples, Operate. uh, your operating costs. Because not only do you have all these people making the snow, but the on top of this, you got to groom everything every night because what you got is young ice. You don't have snow. Especially in that day, yeah. very early snowmaking was uh, we, very water laden. Mm -hmm. We, at Tenney, we only needed one groomer for the whole mountain. Look at the number of groomers that you see at Waterville or oh, yeah. Loon. And you need or, real machinery to do that. Yeah. But that was at a time when we still had a pretty decent uh, uh, snowfall. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, we had some tough years, but right. the snowfall was more, uh, not necessarily reliable, but there was a deeper snow uh, uh, pack uh, in those days compared to now. 
uh, and uh, and of course again the fact that Tenney held it snow was extremely yes. important. Mm -hmm. well, I, I remember I charted uh, <clears throat> uh, length of season and what stuck in my mind and this is in the early days but with the big mountain uh, we were open <clears throat> a maximum of 126 days uh, and a minimum <laughs> of 85 and mm. that 85 days well, I remember that real clearly because approximately the 15th of March mm -hmm. it went from full winter I mean full winter to full spring wow. in seven days of rain. Well if you think about it we just experienced that right now. Yeah. Uh, the snowpack such as it was was great up until uh, that heavy rain in the last two weeks yeah and and I had a, a deja vu all over again uh, Mike Long and I on that time at, at that time at Tenney uh, it poured hot water and we went from full skiing and full coverage to nothing yeah. and we sitting at the little lodge tavern going well that's the end of that <laughs> so we started drinking beer and cleaning the place up <laughs> there's no sense in Imagining that we're going to go on, it was over with. What year was that? It was in the late seventies, mid seven, okay. mid seventies. I would say seventy six, seventy seven, seventy seven, somewhere in there. I I can't remember. Well, I remember because I had the little lodge tavern. Yeah. Let it go. Let and, it go. Uh, so it would have been right in that area. So. Yeah. I want to know if you had celebrities there. Did anybody well. show up in those <laughs> years? Well, there's there's. <laughs> I don't know. Do you want to talk about the the Shah or anything? Um, Should we? If that's a no-no, we can. Uh, I'll I'd rather it. not. All we right. have right. made a, a, an agreement yes. to okay. not ever divulge yeah. that. Okay, but the audience can read into what you're saying. Sure. Sure, that sounds great. But again, highlights. Let's talk highlights of your time <clears> and. <throat> Perhaps the low time was when you didn't get the snow. Oh yeah, oh, that's my goodness. for sure. <laughs> Very difficult, and of course the season ticket was based on 10 uh, days. Yeah. So it was the equivalent of 10 day tickets. Yep. And so, you know, in order to serve our customers, we had to be open at least 10 days. Hmm. Now, if we're open, I mean, it is incumbent upon the skier to come and show up. We felt, at any rate, we did our part. Now, we were never only open 10 days, but on the year that we were open 85 days, it was very nerve-wracking because you're sitting here going, well, do we have to uh, do something with the season tickets? Do we have to give people their money back? To, and, and typically, in the ski industry, uh, nobody really gives money back. They will now, uh, I, and I don't know how it is so much today, uh, you know, you'll get vouchers for another day if you... But, but pretty much it's, it, it's incumbent upon the skier to come in, evaluate the snow, evaluate the day, and, and decide if they're going to buy a ticket. But by the same token, we have to provide the skiing. And when it's 85 days, sure, you start to worry, oh, we, we yes. want to make sure we service our customers. Yeah. And we did hmm. just, I mean, we did times 8.5, but still, knowing full well that people can't be there every day, it still makes you think. Might be fun for the audience. Can you think about the price of a ticket then? Oh goodness! And what oh. the price of the ticket is today? Just I remember what the average price was in the later part of uh, the seventies, and that would have been about a twenty-dollar uh, all-adult, all-area ticket at the top. But the average price would be lower than that because you had child, you had half day, you had all of this, bringing the price down, at which came to about ten dollars a person. Well, it seemed to me that we wow. were at four. <clears throat> 95 when we opened. Oh, it was. I, I have single ride tickets for a dollar, um, which we sold single ride tickets yeah. back then, uh, and half day tickets, which is still a thing. Yeah. Um, uh, very, very. Uh, $65. Inexpensive. Um, Season ticket? Hmm? Sixty-five dollars. Sixty-five for for a single uh, uh, all season pass. And, uh, and again, as far as innovation, uh, our father was, I believe, one of the first to have transferable tickets. In other words, you could buy a season ticket if you were a family, and if you had a guest come, they could use that season ticket, no name on it. Otherwise, 
the ticket goes with the person. So that was an innovation, and the whole thing of all of the uh, ski ambassadors that you see everywhere, we had a ski ambassador that was written up in uh, a skiing magazine or ski magazine, one of the two, and that was Tom Smith. Mm. And basically what you would do is he would meet you at the top of the mountain, and he had a sign that said, if you want some accompaniment uh, down the mountain, and if you want some tips on skiing, he was a very good skier, uh, he would ski with you. And that was... I've never heard of an ambassador before that, and I think that was probably a first of its kind or very close to it. Is that a Tom Smith that was associated with Waterville? <clears throat> well, he lived up on, uh, uh, in that area. Ah. And uh, so he was, uh, he was photographed in uh, Ski Skiing Magazine uh, uh, specifically for that uh, position. You well, were innovators. You were truly innovators well, in the field. Well, it wasn't, wasn't us necessarily. It was, it was, it was Dad. Mm -hmm. it, right. And, and uh, He wanted everybody to ski. His, yes. His yes. primary goal was that you would come and ski and you would enjoy yourself. Yes. And that yeah. lends itself to the saying on the wall that said, at Tenney Mountain there is no terrain developed especially for those who cannot learn mm. to ski. Yeah. And the gist of that is, if you're a ski bunny, if you're a wannabe, if, if you are not an avid you know, skier that really wants to ski, go somewhere else, basically. Yeah. That was his nice way of saying, <laughs> yeah. go to the Fru-Fru Mountains and <laughs> sit by the fire and sit right. or whatever, yeah. mm. but not here. He, uh, there were some other things that were unique. Uh, uh, number one, yeah. uh, Tenney employed a registered nurse <laughs> on duty at the base lodge. Uh, obviously, she was dressed in ski clothes. Uh, but I believe this is, was a result of father's experience <laughs> with having a registered nurse at BB River uh, for everything. She took any accident that took place, she uh, filled out an accident form, etc. She provided uh, uh, first aid and training uh, for all of the ski uh, patrol. Uh, the second thing is that the ski school, uh, once the big mountain was uh, opened, the ski school was subsidized by the lift tickets. And if you bought a, uh, an all-day lift ticket, uh, you got a coupon worth one-sixth of a ski lesson. And you could accumulate uh, uh, transfer, do whatever you wanted mm. with that. All you had to do was, was uh, be able to present six of these coupons and you got an, uh, a, a ski lesson. Uh, every um, every uh, season ticket came with two uh, free ski lessons. The result of this was that, quite frankly, tennis skiers we're better skiers. I can still spot tenny skiers yeah. <clears throat> at water. I mean, at uh, uh, Loon. I see a lot. A lot of people transferred up to Loon, um, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I still can pick them out. But uh, again, <laughs> that goes to his interest in having people uh, learn to ski and learn to ski the best they can and enjoy the sport. And yeah. it also did one other thing: uh, when somebody's taking a lesson. They're not on the slope anymore particularly. They're less on the slope. They're less in line. They're less on the lift. They're learning. And so it actually, when you think about it, uh, you can theoretically sell another day ticket or a portion of a day ticket because these people are no longer clogging things up, which was never the case at Tenney anyway. Right. Mm. Uh, and you don't want to violate the, the, the uphill versus downhill capacity mm. ratio. The, the, the trick here also was that tenny skiers were safer skiers as a result of this. That was the goal. I believe that, uh, mm. that if, if you collected statistics, mm. I have no basis for this, but uh, if you collect statistics that we had fewer injuries and accidents mm. than other mountains. Mm. That brings to mind a question that you asked about celebrities, and I'm going to bring up a celebrity who is um, there's a guy named Duncan Coleman oh, yeah. who at any given time was the best skier in the world. 
Like he, Bodie Miller. Uh, a lot like Bodie Miller. <laughs> well, I won't go there. Yeah. But at any rate, uh, he won the Inferno race uh, yeah. on Mount Washington, and the guy that came in second was Tyler Palmer, and he was the first uh, World Cup gold medalist for the United States. So Duncan Coleman beat the best in the world at one point. Huh. And unfortunately, he was a bit of a uh, uh, bohemian, let's say, <laughs> and uh, struggled to, uh, he could have been on the U.S. ski team at any time, mm. a fantastic, capable uh, too racer. Mu too much of a revolutionary. Uh, too much of a revolutionary, <laughs> yes. Mm. Uh, but, but the racing trail was named after him. My father had a fondness for him. And uh, it was named the the culmination. That's nice. To, yeah. That's nice. As a play on words. Mm -hmm. And and the mm -hmm. interestingly, the rate what the racing trail was the uh, 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 <coughs> can't come up with the right word the uh, default. Uh, <coughs> if Canon couldn't accommodate. Uh, something because oh, of, that. of, a good of bad uh, <clears throat> it, it, when it, when Cannon had terrible conditions. Tenney's racing trail was the default to hold the race on. Well, they had to stop mm -hmm. starting the races above the top headwall because so many people the transition and the G-force at the bottom of the headwall, which is fairly steep. I skied that with uh, Dan Egan once when he was up there working for Snow Magic. Mm -hmm. And of course he blew down over there and about part way down my legs cramped and he thought that was the funniest thing on earth. But <laughs> at any rate, um, the transition was so brutal that they, they, they were disqualifying and, and, and falling right immediately at, at the beginning of the race. Yeah. So they would start it out a little lower. Incredible. <laughs> How many years did the mountain exist with your family? Nineteen. Nineteen. All right. What was happening near the end? <laughs> well, the, near the end, the snow, the reliability of the snow mm -hmm. was becoming uh, tenuous, really. Yep. And uh, plus, that, plus, you had mm -hmm. refused to make snow. That's part of it. Would it not be? Well, you can't. Yes and no. You can't make snow when it mm -hmm. rains. <laughs> right. Take me back. <laughs> so, um, yeah, my, my father resisted making snow um, for the reasons that Stephen touched on. But it was becoming a time in New England where you really have to make snow or you're not going to be able to survive. And so that would be a big transition mm -hmm. uh, for, for a ski area to make. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> he actually, when I was 25, he offered to have me run the place. He was at a point where he was older and it was, uh, you know, it was a lot of work and he wanted to know if I wanted to run it and I felt at the time that the, uh, the debts were especially high compared to its earning capability mm -hmm. without taking on a partner which my parents were very adamant about not yep. taking another partner. They had had a partner with Hope and John, and that was fine. But when they ended up buying out uh, Hope and John, they decided that no more partners. And the unfortunate part of that, and I sometimes think about it, he became fast friends with the uh, fellow that uh, developed Snowbird in uh, Utah, mm -hmm. and uh, which is a great ski area, and this guy was an oil... Uh, tycoon of some kind, obviously had a deep pockets and found a friendship in my father through the Ski Area Association. <coughs> and uh, I always thought, wow, that would have been a good partner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> food facilities. From the very beginning, did yes. you have food facilities Absolutely. there? Absolutely. Yes. On December 26th, the okay. food was being served. All right. <laughs> I was playing in the boxes, again, opened two 55-gallon drums, yeah. uh, planks across them for the counter, yeah. took all the boxes for cups, storage, any of the uh, uh, supplies, filled the bottom uh, to make the counter space. And I can remember 
writing on the cardboard boxes down there because I was, you know, I was six years old. Yeah. And uh, hmm. that was the best way I could stay out of the way, I guess. Hmm. And my mother were cooking on the grill. Yep. And uh, Hope uh, selling tickets and uh, also helping with the uh, food concession. I'm going to look for that picture, the way you said <coughs> hamburgers were 25 cents. That has uh, Any Sharon song? Sonia in it and Janie French, I think. All right. I'll look for that. Did you hear that? <laughs> we're telling him what to do now. <laughs> All right. Uh, so you <coughs> folks, mom and dad, decided to sell the mo mountain when? Um, <coughs> 7980. 7980. Yeah. Right. That season. Yeah. yeah. And have things over the years gone from one hand to another hand? Well, Not here's one. the thing. I think that <coughs> I think to all of us in the family, it was so obvious how to run a ski area and how to achieve success yes. mm -hmm. that we didn't appreciate the fact that Others, the, the would other side, it, so was, desperately it was not to put so it kindly. Right. Okay. It, it, it was not <coughs> obvious to other people. Well, you learned on the way. Well, That's, I think the mm -hmm. biggest uh, part of that is our father was a 10th mountain skier. When he was, uh, you know, a teenager, uh, he was, uh, well, I guess he would have been around 20 or so. Uh, he was driving up to the Cardigan Mountain. Facility four, four hours in in imagine the car from Providence, Rhode Island on the back roads Yeah, yep. you got to be an avid skier to do in four to six hours. I'll say depending yep. on the weather And, and well, probably a car out I, of the I, 20s. I maybe. guarantee you it was always a four-hour trip Because I experienced it <laughs> <laughs> So but in a in a, a better car no less mm -hmm. probably for you Well, but anyway, it was, so it, this it, is the kind 19, of devotee 1934 Plymouth that's a nice brand new car for you. <laughs> so imagine a devotee that it, it takes to do that and nobody else, no other owners have had that kind of, those kind of credentials yeah. and that kind of enthusiasm. Nobody else, the only one that comes close, and he wasn't an owner, of course, who was a tremendous enthusiast, is Dan Egan. Hmm. But he was, uh, you know, hired as a, as a manager. And, uh, but as far as owners go, Nobody else. Yeah. Nobody knew what the product was. If you don't know what the product is, how do you make it? How do you sell it? How do you promote mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. um, and my father went on to put up the first three lifts at Loon uh, for Sherman Adams. He put up the, uh, the lift, the, the big chair in, uh, above Moosehead Lake on Big Squaw Mountain. Uh, he was uh, involved with Tom Corcoran as far as you know, friendly advice. This is why uh, Waterville started with Stadley Lifts. It was because of my father. Um, and so he was uh, very involved, and in fact, Dan Egan presented to my father, which I received on his behalf, the uh, Bill Whitney Award uh, mm -hmm. for uh, being a, a ski pioneer in the state of New Hampshire. Incredible. And uh, Incredible. so he was one hell of a guy mm -hmm. as far as skiing goes. Well, everything goes back to the love of skiing. It does. Oh, yes. Yeah, it really does. It does. Yes, and yes. we're so lucky to live where we live mm -hmm. and have participated. I stopped skiing one year ago, but at least we had Shame something we looked I know, sorry. We, we had something to look forward to mm -hmm. every winter. Yes. Well, you every need something winter. to look forward to. In yes, yes. Yeah. I would ask a personal question. Your children, mm. do they ski? Yes. Both of mine went over to the dark side, <laughs> which means they're snowboarders. <laughs> oh, okay. oh, oh. <laughs> And my son is a exceptionally good snowboarder. My daughter was a good snowboarder, but I don't think she snowboarded in a while. She lives in New Jersey now, so that makes that more yeah. difficult. A little difficult. Uh, yeah. My two boys uh, are in pretty good shape uh, on uh, skiing. They skied at Tenney. Uh, but I remember very clearly my youngest, Mark, uh, debated whether who, uh, about going up to uh, bring his snowboard uh, up to uh, Tuckerman Ravine. And when I realized that that was on his mind, I said, absolutely, do it. Because I knew that he would be a, a, 
a uh, rather unique individual. It was very early on in mm -hmm. the snowboarding, and he was the he was the only kid in, and he was very young. He was the only kid in in a Tuckermans on that day mm -hmm. uh, that uh, had a uh, snowboard. And, and it's nice to see they had a passion. He, he saw the wisdom. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that opened up a, <clears throat> a whole new market. A lot of people have trouble with snowboards, a lot of skiers. I don't. Uh, they, a lot of them come from the uh, skateboard surfing community, so they're new customers. Yep. It's, it's broadening the market, mm -hmm. and the, I think it's a good thing. The problem that exists between skiers and snowboarders is that <laughs> there is a natural periodicity to turning for each one, yes. and they are not equal. Well, especially with a snowboarder, there's a thing called the backside, and you have to be extremely careful of being on the backside of a snowboarder. In other words, they have their back, they can't see you. If you're approaching them from above, and I actually bumped into one yesterday. <laughs> it, just, it was one of these, we touched yeah. tips. He, I didn't dare go on his backside, I thought he was gonna go, and they're always gonna jib something on the side of the trail. Mm -hmm. Ooh, you know, they go, ooh, I can jump that. <laughs> <laughs> so he's heading left, and he was an older guy, uh, he wasn't a kid, and I went, okay, he's heading left. So I went by him on the right, and he turned immediately. Now I'm on his front side, thank goodness, because he saw me, and we both kind of just pushed, tapped, yeah, and, and went. But they're very tricky to anticipate where they're going yep. compared to skiers. Yes. <clears throat> so when you're overtaking them, you've got to be very careful. By the same token, when anybody's overtaking you, you've got to pay attention, <laughs> even though the responsibility lies to the uphill skier. We have just a minute left. Is there something we've missed that you'd like to share with the audience? Yes. It, it, there's a, there was also a policy at Tenney Mountain uh, that uh, to cut off ticket sales after the lift line uh, arrived at a certain length. It was basically uh, a hunt, you know, uh, one and a half times the weight uh, of the uh, the uh, uh, trip up the mountain. So it was an 18 minute lift line. Yeah. And uh, f Father did that because he felt that it was gonna happen anyway. Uh, you're gonna, and you, you shouldn't be rewarding uh, the people that, that can't get out of bed in the morning uh, and get out and be enthusiastic <laughs> about <laughs> skiers, you know, it fit right in there. Mm -hmm. And it ensured that the mm -hmm. person who'd bought the ticket didn't have it degraded during that time. So, And it would expand beyond that after we cut off because there are people that are in the lodge. Or sometimes it would coincide with lunch and then people would come out. Yep. But it never really went beyond 25 minutes. Okay. And the lift line, at, we never had a corral. It was always single file. It was mm. a big social event. Yep. Nobody was allowed to c uh, cut a uh, line. Uh, and my father, as the owner, never cut line, ever. He would wait in line. All he, of the family. He felt these people yes, yes. paid. That's Who is right. he? To step in front yeah, of that. That's right. All the families mm -hmm. required to be in line. No, nobody could cut. The mm. uh, ski, 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 ski school and ski, ski school. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but that's they're, it. they're working. Yeah. I think I'd still be in bed, but my children are the first run people. They oh, want yeah. to take that first run. That's me. <laughs> yeah. Best snow. Uh, gentlemen, thank you. Uh, You're welcome. I saw you a couple of months ago. I'm seeing you now. Mm -hmm. I'm thanking you for the stories that you have shared today on tape. I think the uh, audience is truly going to go back a little bit in history when they came down the slopes in Tenney Mountain and say, I was there. Well, thank you for putting up with us. <laughs> I was going to say, and anybody else out there, you can just turn us off if you don't like what you see. Oh, I like <laughs> uh, To our audience, thank, thank you again. It was a little bit different. Yes, it was. I hope you enjoyed what they had to share today. The, the halls were with us. Maybe we can have you back again. <laughs> Big bro and little bro. You got there it. Go. I know. How many years difference between the 14. two of you? 14. 14 years. Oh, my goodness gracious. Until we talk to you again. Thank you for joining us on the Memories of Plymouth.